Hello, I'm Andrew Curry from the University of Strathclyde and I'll be presenting my research on autistic traits and spatial imagery in literary narrative reading, which is part of my PhD project. In this presentation, I'll explore what role spatial imagery could play during literary narrative reading and furthermore how investigating autistic cognitive traits could help clarify this. I'll be focusing in particular on spatial comprehension and spatial phenomenology which are two components of the spatial imagery we form for literary narratives. I'm interested in whether spatial imagery might contribute to narrative comprehension in certain experiences like narrative absorption. I'll also look at how this might be measured experimentally and more generally by using spatial imagery relative to autism as a case study. I'll be asking how neurodiversity or non-neurotypicality can shape our understanding of how readers engage with literary text, a question with many underexplored ramifications. First, I'll start by defining what spatial imagery is. It's a type of mental imagery we use to mentally represent the relations between objects in space in the absence of external perceptual information. The content of such imagery typically includes imagining spatial relations amongst objects and the movement of objects in space. Spatial imagery is also understood to form one of two subsystems that form visual mental imagery, the other being object imagery, which involves imagining in detail what certain objects look like in terms of their shape, their colour, their texture and so on. If we imagine a room, for example, we not only imagine what the objects in it look like, but how they are configured and arranged spatially. Or if we imagine a landscape, we not only imagine what objects form its scenery, like hills or trees, but how far away each object is to one another or how close. Spatial imagery is also related to perspective taking. For example, we can experience spatial imagery from a first person perspective or a third person perspective through either egocentric or allocentric processing. Through a first person perspective, the spatial relations are defined by what's relative to the imaginer's view. Like for example, I imagine the book on my left in the room. And through a third person perspective, spatial relations are defined by object to object relations, like the book is to the left of the table in the room. When we read literary narratives, it's likely that we use the same kind of imagery I've just described. We not only imagine the visual, auditory and even sensory motor aspects of the story worlds they create, but also their spatial properties. Literary narratives also furnish readers with spatial descriptions of the scenes and events that occur in them. These descriptions can, for example, consist of the spatial layout of interior and exterior spaces, how characters are located in certain spaces, and how they move through them. And in the next slide is a passage from El Verdugo by Balzac, which demonstrates how spatial descriptions appear in literary narratives. And this is the passage that I've just referred to. You can pause the video and read it yourself. We see in this passage that landmarks and features of the environment are located relative to the officer. For example, parts of the environment are located relative to body parts like the head and feet. The passage also specifies what elements of the environment appear in different directions and how close and far away they are. Together, these descriptions could allow readers to add further layers of detail to the scene that they imagine. It could produce a sense of magnitude, and depth or even a sense of three-dimensionality. Furthermore, the use of the officer as a spatial anchor allows these various environmental elements to connect with one another as they converge around them. Making the officer function this way spatially produces an integrated, spatially coherent environment which could have immersive effects for readers. Relating these spatial features to the officer could also act as a focalising device, encouraging egocentric perspective taking by restricting these spatial descriptions to the officer's implicit visual perspective. There is evidence too which shows that the kind of spatial imagery that readers could produce in response to stories like Balzac's can support comprehension. Firstly, the manner in which we mentally construct scenes for literary narratives potentially relies on internal scene construction, which is used for episodic memory and imagining future or fictitious events. Internal scene construction also depends on the ability to generate spatial coherence, that is, to understand the spatial relations between objects in a mentally simulated environment. It's therefore likely that for imagining scenes for literary narratives, we need to have the ability 
to generate spatial coherence through internal scene construction. Discourse processing models of reading have also found that readers tend to keep track of spatial information during comprehension, especially as they construct situation models for texts. This involves tracking where protagonists are and where they move to how close or far away certain objects are relative to the protagonist. Readers also form expectations as to how protagonists might move through spaces, and spatial representations can guide the causal inferences readers make during reading. In the Balzac passage, for instance, readers could track where the officer is and where everything in the environment is located relative to him. Readers also might form inferences about where the officer could potentially move. Might, for example, the music from the castle attract the officer so that he moves away from the terrace and into the ballroom? Based on these findings, it's plausible that spatial imagery must have some purpose in the ability to comprehend narratives. The phenomenological aspects of spatial imagery could also contribute to subjective experiences in literary narrative reading. For instance, spatial descriptions can cause an increase in the sense of presence, that is, the sense of perceptually being there in a fictional world that readers feel. Furthermore, beyond spatially orienting readers, egocentric and allocentric spatial frames can affect immersion such that reading a narrative from a first-person perspective is more immersive for readers. Would this mean then that if spatial descriptions were removed from the Balzac passage, would the sense of presence and immersion be removed also? And would changing the story from third person to first person change what kind of spatial imagery is produced? However, beyond these findings, very little is known about how spatial imagery aids processing and comprehension and furthermore shapes literary reading in aesthetically meaningful ways. One topic I propose that researchers could explore experimentally is whether, firstly, readers' cognitive traits affect the capacity to generate spatial imagery during reading, and secondly, whether variations in these traits impact literary reading. To explore this topic, I suggest that researchers could, in the future, approach readers of literary narrative with neurodivergent cognitive traits. As a, as a specific example, I draw attention to the cognitive traits associated with, but not unique to autism, that may influence what kind of spatial imagery is produced for literary narrative texts. But why look at autistic cognitive traits in this context? Well, generally, studying very low or very high spatial imagery abilities found in a particular population can allow us to see the relationship to spatial comprehension and spatial phenomenology. This could provide a much clearer picture about spatial imagery in reading than with neurotypical readers, where its effects might be less noticeable. So what spatial imagery traits are associated with autism? Well, there's strong evidence that some autistic people display enhanced visual-spatial mental imagery in line with the enhanced perceptual functioning found in some autistic individuals. There's evidence, for example, that some autistic individuals perform exceptionally well in the spatial manipulation of visual mental imagery, like figuring out the rotation of 3D figures in letters. In language comprehension, there's evidence too that some autistic individuals rely on visual-spatial thinking to understand verbal content as shown through brain imaging and in the self-reported use of this style of thinking in everyday situations. There's also evidence that high spatial imagery abilities are linked to synesthesia and savant abilities in autism, although this is rare. Yet there is also evidence that some autistic individuals have poor spatial navigation abilities, with a diminished ability to generate maps for environments in virtual reality settings, for example. There are also reported differences in spatial perspective taking in autism, wherein some autistic visuals have difficulties in seeing space from a different person's perspective. This can entail having difficulties in seeing how objects are reoriented from another perspective. It's also been reported that mental imagery for imaginary scenes in terms of spatial coherence can be much more fragmentary and less coherent. With these traits in mind then, it's possible to hypothesise that some autistic readers might present differences in spatial imagery abilities and exploring these traits could potentially lead to interesting areas of investigation, which I'll highlight in the rest of the presentation. We could ask, first of all, whether having different spatial imagery abilities affects how well texts are comprehended in terms of having an abstract understanding of where characters are and where they go. We could also ask whether the degree to which readers experience states like absorption, 
immersion and transportation is related to spatial imagery. Another question to explore is whether spatial comprehension and phenomenology are dissociable. In other words, is spatial phenomenology dependent on spatial comprehension? Lastly, we could investigate whether spatial imagery facilitates other aspects of narrative processing beyond comprehension. For example, does spatial imagery play a much stronger role than we previously thought in areas of cognition like theory of mind during reading? Knowing where and what objects are available to protagonists in narratives might facilitate the processing of character goals as the set of objects in a particular narrative event become implicated in the set of potential environmental interactions that protagonists can engage in. If this is the case, would this also facilitate processes of character engagement like aligning oneself with the thoughts and goals of characters? So what kind of methods could be used to draw out findings about these particular questions? Well, if we wanted to find out about the relationship between spatial comprehension and phenomenology, we could use a mixture of visual spatial imagery tests, self-report measures and behavioural measures alongside textual manipulation. The goal would be to find correlations between different readers' spatial imagery abilities and differences in comprehension and phenomenology in response to narrative texts. Autistic participants would be compared in this scenario with a control group, a neurotypical population. If we wanted to investigate the following question, does poor spatial imagery correlate with decreased spatial comprehension during literary narrative reading, we could do it this way. Participant spatial imagery abilities could first be assessed by combining visual spatial cognition tests with questionnaires. Participants could undertake a vividness of object and spatial imagery questionnaire, which asks participants to rate the vividness with which they imagine certain spatial configurations, like the layout of a bedroom, how well they imagine the location of a house and a city map, and how well they understand the notion of parallel parking. This would be correlated with visual spatial imagery tests, such as the embedded figures test, and mental rotation tasks to avoid participant bias and self-reports. It's also been shown that such tests can predict the extent to which individuals report having strong spatial imagery abilities. Another method could be to combine visual spatial tests with post-stimulus questionnaires that measure the degree to which participants form spatially coherent scenes for narratives. This could be measured using the Spatial Coherence Index Questionnaire and the Spatial Presence Experience Scale. The next step would be to ask whether those who report low or high spatial imagery abilities also perform differently in spatial comprehension. This would involve using similar measures used in narrative comprehension experiments. For example, one measure that could be used is the consistency paradigm, in which reading times are measured in response to passages that have breaches in spatial coherence. Such passages normally have a character interacting with an object that is either consistent or inconsistent with the change of location. If researchers wanted to understand the following question, does having strong or weak spatial imagery produce differences in experiencing subjective states like immersion and absorption? We could adopt some of the same measures suggested previously. Participants would first be screened for visual spatial imagery abilities and then take the questionnaires referred to earlier. They would then be presented with text stimuli. And researchers could also scan for spatial markers and manipulate them by removing objects in them. This could be achieved by assessing the quantity and quality of spatial descriptions in a given text, either presented in full or excerpted, using methods for analysing spatial cues, borrowed from the studies mentioned in the slide. This could allow researchers to also explore the relationship between spatial imagery and text characteristics. After, researchers could borrow questions from the transportation scale, the story world absorption scale and the immersion questionnaire, then ask participants to respond to them after reading. There are some limitations, however, that researchers would need to be aware of. One limitation, for example, is that it would be equally possible for researchers 
to study the variation of spatial imagery abilities of just neurotypical readers, since they are likely to vary too. It's also not clear whether the visual spatial skills of autistic people mentioned earlier would relate to spatial imagery skills. Furthermore, it's not clear how these abilities would map into reading them. And another limitation is that other cognitive traits associated with autism might, uh, might affect the results of any test conducted. For example, the low verbal working memory found in some autistic people might affect the results of spatial comprehension tests. So what would be the implications of conducting this kind of research? Well, it would contribute to the better understanding of spatial imagery during reading, which is already a neglected area of study. It would help researchers ask questions like the ones mentioned in the slides. It could help researchers explore more general questions about mental imagery and reading, like how it varies between readers and how neurodivergent traits affect it. It would also represent a new research method in which neurodivergent readers, and in this case autistic readers, are recruited to solve questions regarding the nature of literary narrative reading. And it could also open up new ways of understanding the cognitive differences that make up all readers of literary narratives. Through this process, we could make new important discoveries. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. This is a reference list to go with the presentation as well.